Have you ever wondered about how the cables come to be tested? How the standards are formed? I mean, we've seen the TR42 standard, we've seen the standards for ISO, but what about how that procedure was of writing those standards and how they were put together and tested and validated? Well, it's done by committee, and one of the people who's on that committee, Dan from Ideal Networks, granted an interview. Uh, he actually reached out to me after I did my cabling video, and I was excited, and you know, I was like, well, yeah, of course, I'd love to do an interview. Let's talk about some details. What what about Cat7? Let's talk about the story behind that. Why is there a Cat7 in one standard but not in the other? Uh, what does the little numbers mean on the cable? How do these companies that make the cable uh, get certified to verify that their cable matches the proper spec? You know, so I know I'm buying the right things. Uh, more technical than in-depth answers of why I should stay away from things like, oh, I don't know, copper clad aluminum. And he covers that in depth, including the way the PoE works, the way the higher wattage PoE coming out works, and the problems that may be encountered by using thinner cables on that and testing procedures that are done and how they validate all this. So like I said, it's a long interview filled with technical details. So it's fun because we get to geek out about uh, cabling and all the little detail testing. And he's an excellent, excellent teacher of all this. He's been a long time in the business and a long time on these committees actually creating and assisting in the creation of the standards that we all use. So I'm going to get started here with the interview now. All right. So I am here with Dan Brera. He is the global product manager of cable testing at Ideal Networks, uh, has over 20 years in the cable testing business, uh, helps with the TIA standards and the ISO standards. So you have uh, a lot of experience. You actually go to the events and help write the cabling standards. And this whole conversation came about because came about because you reached out to me after I did my video about those uh, cool little patch cables. Well, they're really novel and from a basic standpoint, I plug them in, I loaded them up with PoE and they do seem to work. You have a lot more technical insight into <laughs> why they work, how they were tested. And because I had alluded to some of the testing and I left a link to like an IEEE testing and TIA standards. Uh, but you know, you do the real side of the testing, so yeah. let's uh, talk about that. Well, th thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so when I was watching that video, I just had an aha moment because here's, um, you know, someone who likes these small gauge patch cords. And when we were doing the last round of standards development, so as you mentioned, I uh, participate on uh, the TIA, which is a telecommunications industry association. So we, that's standards that are primarily used in the Americas. Uh, you know, Canada, U.S., Latin America, some some countries in Asia, England uses them. And then also in ISO, um, which are the broader standards for the kind of the rest of the world. And, um, you know, we, we try to keep things in sync. We call things different. So, for example, um, what you would call or what we call CAT6 in TIA vernacular is Class E in ISO and CAT6A is Class EA and so on. And and then there's, so there's a lot of things that are similar and there's a lot of things that are different. Um, you know, every, every once in a while I hear people talking about CAT7 cable and there will be arguments on comments as either CAT7 exists or doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist in TIA, but it does exist in ISO. So it's just a real thing. That, okay, that is, it is real. That has been a debate that I've not completely understood. Yes. Um, that's an interesting one. So CAT7 is not a TIA standard, but it is an ISO standard. Correct. Yes. Okay. And so we, we, and the other confusing thing is when we, um, we, we talk about standards, there's three sets of performance standards that both organizations develop. Um, so we have components, which would be your connectors. So your, your plugs and your jacks. So those have a performance requirement the cable being like just the raw piece of wire. And those are the standards that the manufacturers would do. So if you're manufacturing jacks or manufacturing wire, you would make sure your products comply with those. And then the third one is the cabling standard. And that's the performance when you marry that stuff together and terminate it in the field. So in, when we talk about the performance of the components, both TIA and ISO use the term category. So we have category, uh, 5, 5E6, 6A7, et cetera. Right. Now, in TIA, we skipped 7. Um, but in <laughs> ISO, when they talk about the, the finished system, so let's let's use CAT6A as an example. So in, in the TIA standards, a CAT6 system that you, uh, Tom, might install would have CAT6A cable, CAT6A connectors, and when you put that all together, you would test it to make sure it has 
um, a CAT 6A performance for the whole link. And ISO, if you were doing that, you'd get CAT 6A jacks and CAT 6A cable, but when you would installed it and tested it, you will use a class EA performance standard, um, which is the cabling standard. So it's the same thing, it's just called different stuff. So they have CAT7 and CAT7A components in ISO, and when they test that, it's called a class F or class FA cabling system. So they, they do exist, it just doesn't usually see our, you know, stuff it's normally not used in the u.s there's some exceptions but you know that's that's one funny confusion so as these standards are written uh and you're doing you you grab a piece of copper uh it has you know a certain gauge to it and things like that um and you're certifying they can handle a data rate as set in the iso or tia standards um how much over like we know that we can get gigabit fine out of you know yeah. cat 5e um how much over is the testing that you do over the spec? Like, obviously we know it links a gigabit, that's a standard, but you know, my own testing right now, I'm plugged in via 10 gig yeah. over a cat five. Cause I haven't replaced with a cat six, but it works. It's a really short yeah. run. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so generally speaking, um, when you're looking at categories of stuff, you you'll see it labeled in frequencies, right? And this is where there's a lot of manufacturer, marketing misinformation so I'll use, <laughs> <laughs> surprise <Yes. laughs> so i'll use um cat six as an example and if we have time um we could talk about there's there's a, a really interesting history about one gig and cat six versus cat six a versus five sorry five e versus cat six and people will argue do you need five e or do you need cat six and i actually have the answer to that question um, I will, I'm interested in that answer. <laughs> okay. But um, so the, generally speaking, in, in, so CAT6 would be 250 megahertz. So when you buy CAT6 cable or, or jacks, um, the, the minimum performance requirement by standard is 250 megahertz. So if you were to test it with one of our certifiers, it would sweep at the 250 megahertz. The operating, the actual operating frequency is 200 megahertz. So it's overswept by 25%. So the rule of thumb kind of since really CAT 5E has been to oversweep um, from a testing standpoint by about 25%. Okay. Uh, so CAT 5E cable, we test to 100 megahertz, although the actual frequency that the signaling is at is 80 megahertz. Um, so 25% of that would be um, 100 megahertz if you overswept that. So. Um, okay. That's about right. So that's kind of the, the general rule of thumb. Uh, so what you're asking about, though, is, you know, if something's rated for one gig at 100 meters, um, which is sort of the limit, you can, yeah. times, can you get it to 110 meters, 120 meters, how much further? And the, the answer is that the, the standards are definitely very conservative. Um, so that if you install something, um, and even if it were to, and this happens all the time. So, you know, we make one of our products or cert the certifiers that an installer would use to make sure the cabling meets whatever category you've installed. And, you know, we do a whole bunch of tests, electrical tests on that um, to see if it passes those specs that are in the standards. If that test fails, it doesn't necessarily mean that the cable won't pass data. And um, in most cases, if it failed by a little bit, it will probably work okay because there's a lot of built-in margin to those standards. So we don't want something where it's just on the edge. Yeah. And it fails but, some measurement by a few tenths of a dB and all of a sudden you can't get data through. Well, 25%, that, that's actually nice because that's a good buffer. It's not like just 10% or something yeah. like that. And we have a number. And I like when we have some finite answers versus, well, you know, a bunch of arguments and forums by people who have never done what you're doing and actually spent the yeah. time engineering this, yeah. um, you know, the uh, sideline engineers. But the it's kind of interesting, too, because I have definitely run over the 300 meter limit um, for single runs because of very unique circumstances. And it was kind of a curiosity, like mm -hmm. we'll try it if it works, if not, we'll stick something else on it. And we've gotten pretty far over with having no challenges with it. So uh, thank you for that buffer. <laughs> yeah, I'd say as long as you're using, um, you know, there's certain measurements that will, will start to fail. So an interesting thing is um, kind of the, maybe the root answer to your question is the Length is really arbitrary. So the 100 meters comes from 
25 years ago when, you know, uh, with 10 megabit, like there was really, that's about as far as they could get it to work. And we've built, so the, the general name for these standards are structured cabling standards. Yeah. And the idea there is to have some structure in universal installation rules and guidance so that, uh, you know, if you go back to the, the 70s and 80s, everything was proprietary. So, you had, you know, IBM would have a certain cabling for their systems and digital equipment, somebody else's, and nothing, you know, you, nothing was compatible. And, and there, there used to be these things back in the day called breakout boxes. And so it was a yes. little lunchbox that had like a DB25 connector on each side and then little jumper wires. So if you were interfacing one brand of computer system to another, you could hook them together and then you would have a cheat sheet and say, okay, jump pin two on this side to pin seven over there, did, 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 you know. Um, <laughs> My first tech job was fixing old Acer Alto uh, point of sale systems. And we had breakout yeah. boxes for the Muxer and the uh, Weiss terminals that we were using to connect them. So exactly. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, when, so when the structure cabling systems uh, standard was started, it was to try to get away from that. Yeah. So, I'm happy. It's, you know, surviving those early days of tech. I started in, a, in the earlier 90s, um, surviving those early days of tech with twin axe networks and yes. uh, putting little ohm very resistors hard. on there. Uh, very, it, it's become so much easier. You know, kids these days don't know how easy they have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just plug stuff together and it works. It just works. It's like, uh, oh man. The, the 100 meter uh, channel limit is is really pretty arbitrary. And frankly, most systems will go over that. And so, this is where you get into an a interesting uh, difference between ISO and TIA again, is in TIA, um, so like one of our cable certifiers, there's, there's two numbers um, to remember for length. So there's 90 meters and 100 meters. And 90 meters is the link. So that's from the patch panel to the wall out, outlet. Um, 90 meters is, is the limit there. Okay. And then when you include patch cords, it can go up to 100 meters. So, um, those are the differences. So we just generally say a hundred meters to, you know, for simplicity. Yeah. But in, um, so if with, for example, one of our testers and you test a cable that's longer than that, um, it, it will by standard, it has to fail that test. And ISO, the length is purely informative. So it could be 110, 120, 130 meters, and it will tell you how long it is, but it does not pass or fail. The, what matters is do the actual measurement parameters, like the signal loss and crosstalk, if those all pass, who cares how long the cable is? Right. It'll work. And so that's really a, kind of a more pragmatic way versus saying it's got to be 100 meters no longer. So, you know, so I, I've, I've had uh, integrators and installers uh, call us before and they're like, I need to, you know, my customers requiring that I test these links. And I needed to go longer than the 100 meters. Otherwise, I'd have to put in fiber and da-da-da-da. How can I test it and make it pass? And, you know, I said, well, use an ISO limit, you know, the same category, same performance metrics. And it will just, you know, give you a number for length, but it won't fail if it's over that 100 meters. Well, when it comes to the manufacturers, when they start making this, you know, the different cable vendors actually making them, putting the copper in the jackets. Mm -hmm. um, how do they, do they submit for testing? Do they just have their own internal labs to follow uh, guidelines set forth so by when, standards? When we're, um, another really good question. So when we're creating the standards, so the, the latest one we, we did was category eight a couple years ago. So there is a cat eight and I know I've seen yeah. some people arguing on the you know, internet about whether that's real or not. And that's, <laughs> uh, it's 40 gig. Now nice. the big difference is cat eight's limited to, to 30 meters instead of 100 Ooh. meters. And we can talk about why, and it has to do with the high frequencies and insertion loss and things like that. Um, but so let's say when we were developing the CAT8 standard, um, the question is how, you know, what type of cabling do you need to make it work? So <clears throat> how this whole, how this stuff starts is IEEE, which, you, you know, they have the ethernet. So like the 100 meg, one gig, 10 gig, whatever those, that's the signaling, um, specifications, the electrical specifications. So IEEE will say, okay, we're going to do a 40 gig chipset ethernet chip. And they'll send that spec to TIA and ISO. And they say, you know, make us a cable that will uh, support this electrical chipset. And then, so, you know, we get off and running and start doing development work and, 
Um, and then a lot of the different cable manufacturers. So in TIA, we have meetings every three months and um, in ISO every six months. So they'll do a bunch of measurements in the lab. They'll, con they'll make prototypes of cabling and do measurements and everybody brings and, and shares their measurement data with each other and, you know, and starts looking at, okay, based on the signal levels, um, you know, this is the type of wire we need to use. For example, with CAT8, it was a big, can we do it unshielded or does it need to be shielded? That was a big thing. Um, what gauge of wire does it need to be? How long can it go? So ultimately the, the spec is, um, derived from practical measurements um, performed by the uh, manufacturers of the cable and the connectivity and stuff. So then that gets fed into the documents. When we write the document, we write the specs of the performance specs based on all of that um, R&D work. Now, I think the question you're asking is, um, if you're then a cable manufacturer and you want to make uh, a CAT 6A cable, how do you know it's gonna work? So you can do your own um, uh, in-house testing, but you'll see on cables, it'll have a ETL mark on it. And um, ETL is a third-party testing lab. So most of us are familiar with UL, like you buy an appliance yeah. that will have a UL mark. So ETL is a lab and they do, they're basically like UL. Um, so you would submit as a manufacturer, um, ETL would come in and they would go in and test samples of your products and if it passes whatever category you're trying to get, you get a certificate that says this brand and this particular model of connector or part number of cable, um, you know, meets those performance requirements. And so make sure the cable has ETL it's, and it's going to be stamped. I think I've noticed that it's, it's stamped on the cable. stamped on the jacket, okay. yeah. So you'll see on the jacket ETL and it'll have a, a, an ID number. And you can, you can go to ETL's website and plug that ID number in and see, um, you know, if who the manufacturer is. And a lot of times when you're, if you're buying sort of like generic branded cable, there'll be like one OEM and that will be the, the manufacturer that, you know, designed and makes the cable. Um, but you might buy that cable under different brands, but that ETL hmm. number will be the same because the underlying design of the cable has been tested and they're just selling it and marking it as, you know, brand ABC. That, that's interesting because something I've tried, I've told people to steer clear of, and I've never done any thorough testing with it, but uh, everything about it from an electrical standpoint sounds wrong, is that copper clad aluminum crap. <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head, um, especially in regards going back to the PoE video on the patch cords. Um, CCA, copper clad aluminum cable, so for, for people who aren't aware of it, it is ultimately, it's a way to reduce cost. So, right. Um, copper is expensive, more more so than aluminum. So copper clad aluminum is where the conductors of the of the cable, um, the wires in your cable are aluminum, and they look, put a little coating or a cladding of copper over the top of it. Now I've seen it where it's marked CCA. Um, people may not know what that means, and and you you know especially if you're buying online or whatever, it's a lot cheaper than other cable. Um, and you're, you're good to steer away from it. And I'll, I'll tell you why there's, there's a reason why it's okay. And then there's reasons why it's bad. <laughs> uh, so not to get too deep in the mud, but generally speaking, the higher the frequency of signal you're putting on a piece of wire, the, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called the skin effect. So you, you can look at Wikipedia on that. So if you imagine you have a piece of wire and the higher the frequency, the signal will travel on the outside skin of that conductor. So if it's like DC current, it travels through the middle of the conductor, but as you go higher and higher frequency, all the signal is pushed to the outside edge. You can sort of imagine it like if you're spinning something, the centrifugal force yeah. will make something spin, and the faster you spin it, the faster it goes. So in theory, uh, if we're talking about high frequency data signals, they're all gonna travel on the outside skin of that cable so if the inside is aluminum and the outside's copper you have a low resistance or low impedance path for the signal and it should work which for the most part data transmission is okay on cca wire but you talk about poe right and so and that's where your problems come in poe is huge like it it's it's funny you know we've for how many years have we been saying fiber is gonna kill copper right uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> fiber can't carry power though. <laughs> yeah, but one thing you can't do with fiber yet is transmit power. So all of these um, sensors and devices and, and um, cam you know, cameras, wireless access points, we wanna power all those with PoE. And uh, so that, that really is kind of one of the things that keeps copper moving over fiber. But going back to what my example of the wire and, and the skin effect, if what I said was DC power goes through the middle of the conductor. So if you have an aluminum conductor with copper on the outside, the high frequency data may get through without much loss, but the power, the DC power you're putting through goes through the middle of that conductor and your loss is at least 20% higher in terms of power loss. Wow. Um, so, so you have two things going against you then is um, with copper clad aluminum, you have a high power loss for PoE. And then also the trend to further reduce costs by making the conductors smaller. So those small patch cords, going back to sort of what brought this whole thing on, yeah. when we were developing the latest draft of the standard, um, we knew people, you know, people love these little patch cords because they're just so small and handy and, you know, you, you, they don't cram up all your wire management. And there is um, a significant amount of power loss in those. So there's a, an addendum in our, in our stand, last standard um, on using um, 28 gauge power, 28 gauge cords. And I think some of the ones you had were like 30 or 32 gauge. The newest ones for Monoprice are 32 gauge, which I found interesting because I didn't find anything in either standard for 32 gauge. Yeah, the standard only recognizes down to 28. So if, if it's anything smaller than 28, which is a larger number, that's outside the scope of the standard. Not saying it would work, but right. the loss would be even worse um, on a cable like that. What would be interesting is to see if if the cable's marked with, on the 32 gauge, uh, 568.2-3, so that's the newest standard, 568.2-3. If you see that on a like 30 or 32 gauge cable, then that's not technically correct because the standard doesn't recognize that. And they don't. I went all over, even on the, the page mono price, uh, the only ones I know that manufacture the 32 gauge, so I mentioned them by name, um, they do not have any certs listed on that one. Only because right. the other, the 28 gauge one was also for mono price and that one does have yeah. uh, reference, but the other ones do not. They, well, that's they, good. You know, so they're marketing, they're they just kind of omitted honest, it. They're being honest in their yeah. advertising to people who are aware of that, right? Right. But, you know, a lot of people would have no clue as to what any of that meant. Yeah, you know, people shop by price and, hey, that looks convenient and not yeah, always. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, the, yeah, they, they will work and, and, you know, for shorter distances, um, you know, as far as the power goes. Um, so I, I use them myself. I have tons of them around here because um, I won't pan this camera around, but my office is just full of test equipment cabling, it's, it's crazy. And I've got just so much stuff that those little patch cords are so easy when I'm connecting testers to all different types of, um, you know, test fixtures and things that I'm working with. I, I love them too, but, um, but as far as PoE testing goes, uh, you know, there's a, um, and you know, in full disclosure, we, I saw that video and I sent you one of our, a new tester. We yeah. And we're, we, we just got the new tester, by the way, so we're excited to start testing new yeah, awesome stuff with that. Confidence. So it, if you use that, you will see the voltage drop, and, and I can explain how it works to you later, but you'll, you'll see different voltage drops depending on the, the length and the size of the wire and different amount, you know, less, less power able to come through small cables like that. So there is, in reality, there is a practical um, limitation how much power you can get through those. Yeah, and that's, uh, well, that's one of the things I thought about right away. So a little bit of my background, besides working in tech, for a while I had a, a TV repair store. We did a lot of board level electronics player. And so, you know, I studied a lot of that and um, not professionally, but, you know, to make sure I understood what the engineers that worked for me did. And, you know, I just understand that as the copper gets smaller, there is so many losses. That's why there were certain minimums when we, you know, of course, we're dealing with a lot of 30,000 to 90,000 volts on the old TV repair we were doing, yeah. uh, but the same concepts apply. So right away when I seen them, like the, the laws of physics are like, hey, I can only get so much electricity through certain gauges of copper. This seems, you know, probably good for lower end PoE devices, but once you look at some of these higher end, uh, like a PTZ camera, for example, mm -hmm. that's got a much different wattage profile than a Wi-Fi access point. Exactly, and, and you know, with the new, uh, 
uh, 802.3bt standard, you can get 90 watts or more um, from some of these devices. So that, that little tester will actually um, try to draw. So you, what, how it works is you hook it up, you can hook it up directly to a, a, an access point or a switch, sorry, uh, an injector or a switch. Yeah. Um, and it'll pull power, it'll tell you, you know, what class and how many watts you're getting. Or you could be at the end of the cable. So if you put in that 120 meter run um, and you want to know how much power is there, you can plug it in and it'll say, okay, you're getting 23 watts or however many watts available. And you can look at the specs of the device that you're going to put there and make sure that that is supplying enough power um, for what you need to do. And, and that's where things, you know, from if you're just sort of playing around and experimenting, that's where things get interesting is where you put, you know, you measure the power right at the switch and then you put on some cable and measure the power at the end of the cable. Um, you'll, you will see some drop and it depends on the quality of the switch you're using. Some of them are, are very well regulated where um, I'll just use 30 Watts as an example where it's, it's specced to deliver 30 Watts. Um, but that should be 30 Watts at the end of a hundred meters of cable. So you, so some good switches or injectors, you will see 30 with a tester like that. If you plug it directly in, you'll see 30 Watts. Or if you go to 120 meters of cable, you'll see 30 Watts because that the power supply in there has a bunch of margin going back to having extra margin built in, um, that, it's been designed to deliver at least that much power over hundred meters. Where if you go to like a, a cheap POE injector, you might see 30 Watts when you plug it directly in, but you put on hundred meters of cable and you might see 15 or 20 Watts or something like that because it's not, it doesn't have enough headroom built in. So that is yeah. a big thing with POE and we're hearing from customers is, you know, troubleshooting devices and trying to figure out if it's the device, the cable, the injector, you know, where the problem is. And I've done a little bit of that troubleshooting, you know, breaking out the electronics hat again. Uh, you know, we did used to do troubleshooting even on things like if you're with really high end audio equipment or Macintosh, mm -hmm. that was one of our niches was repairing a lot of the equipment and you would see the different specs. Like sure. They all claim a similar standard, but you start putting the meters on things and loads on them. You're like, okay, I can see there's a difference. And we've had trouble where we've had cabling problems with, uh, we do a lot of camera systems mm -hmm. and it turned out that the, it wasn't the right wattage coming out of an old switch. I don't know if the switch became defective, but it was causing any of the longer lengths of cable was causing problems. So yeah. I was just putting just a standard, you know, multimeter and I go, the voltage is wrong. <laughs> well, yeah. And um, so it, you'll totally get this, but when people, you know, we talk about POE and voltage, you know, it's generally around 48 volts. And so um, I'll just hold up an example of, so this is a, actually one of the sort of prototypes. So this is the little tester I'm talking about, and this is not a pitch or anything, but we had a version of this that just does cable testing, uh, TDR, and it would detect PoE. So if you plugged it into PoE, it would just say, okay, there's PoE, what pins it is, and you know, how many volts, 48 volts, for example. Um, but that's not while pulling a load. That's an unloaded test. So the, the, the new version of this, which looks exactly the same, it'll tell you two things. It'll tell you that voltage with no load. And then when it's drawing power, what's the voltage? And I kind of use an example, and you're up north, so you're probably familiar with the uh, dead car battery in the winter yes. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell someone the difference is if you, know, you have a car battery and you go out and you put your voltmeter on it with light everything's lights off and all that and you might get 12 volts 13 volts whatever okay and now hold that voltmeter on there while you crank the engine over and you'll see that if that battery is not super healthy you'll see that voltage plummet and if you know you're hearing tick 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 you know the yeah. voltage is dropping down to just a few volts uh we're on a healthy battery it will drop a couple volts but you know be able to put enough power out to turn the starter motor start the car and still stay in that voltage range so it's the same thing like what you're talking about with either the PoE source or if you have copper clad aluminum cabling, you're gonna lose a lot of power in the wire itself. And so the tester will, this new one will say, okay, here's the unloaded voltage and then here's the voltage under load. And, and if you see it drop a couple volts, that's normal. If you see it drop 10 volts, that's not normal. And that, that's telling you, okay, there's a lot of loss in your cabling. Yeah. And I mean, that's going to cause all these device problems because when you, once you start undervolting a device, you immediately end up with a device with random behaviors. So. Exactly. Exactly. And it, and it could be 
the installation. I've been, I've done troubleshooting at hospitals with access points and it's for, for um, installers and integrators, these types of devices are great because um, a real world example, we had an access point that was, it would randomly reboot and stuff just like you were saying. And so I, you know, we did a power test on it and um, we, we weren't getting the power we were expecting. So we went to the IT department and the guy we were talking to swore up and down to, no, it's not the switches. All the switches are programmed fine. Nobody's, and I was like, look, man, I just tested it. We're only getting whatever number we're getting. And so he kind of, fine. He logged into the switch and went, oh. <laughs> and I told him what port number we were at. He's like, oh, that port was set to a low power mode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so he, he, you know, he flipped it back to full power and everything worked fine. But, you know, you could, you could chase your tail for days trying to, to troubleshoot stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's hard enough, the network engineering, when it all works. <laughs> so exactly. Troubleshooting those problems. So when you add some uh, randomness of power problems, that just gets crazier. Yeah. Now let's go back to something you said, uh, Cat 5e versus Cat 6. Oh, Okay. And, get that and, answer. And one gig, one <laughs> gig bit. So that, so do you? This is the source of constant argument. I see. Do you need Cat Five E or Cat Six for one gig? Um, the answer is, you can use either. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when when one gig was first being developed, so I, you know you're talking in the mid '90s or whatever. Um, there's and if you if you you know use your Googler and you look up 1,000 base T. And 1000 base TX, TX or T, you'll see two different things. Uh, and I can't remember which, which one was which, but there was two philosophies of how to deploy one gig. Um, so one philosophy was, you know, and again, this is the mid 90s. So everybody had just upgraded, including the company I was at, to Cat5 cable and probably not even Cat5e at that point, but everyone had all these brand new Cat5 installations. And so one thought point was, well, we, we'd like to be able to um, get these um, Cat5 installations from 100 meg to one gig without people having to tear out cable. So uh, what they did is, is that chipset, um, the, the fire, the chipset, was designed to use all four pairs. Um, so, it, so before that, with, with 10100 Ethernet, you're using um, two pairs in each direction. So two pairs going this way and two pairs going the other way and they don't talk to each other you know it's it's like you know it's one each each pair is a one-way street right so with the um the one of the solutions was to use all four pairs in both directions still at 100 megahertz because we know that cable will perform at 100 megahertz but basically use a very sophisticated encoding something called echo cancellation um, which is um, sort of like crosstalk but you'd have very expensive network cards, but you could put them on your existing Cat5 cable and, and get one gig out of it. The other option was to go the route of using less expensive network cards and um, use Cat6 cable. So the network cards in those cases, they would have run at 200 megahertz um, and then required Cat6 cable because the Cat5e cable only supported 100 megahertz. So basically, you'd say, well, we can have, even though the, it sounds weird, even though the frequency is higher, it's a 200 megahertz signal, you didn't have all the expensive DSP uh, technology filtering and all that on the chip. So back in the 90s, DSP stuff was very expensive. So you could kind of brute force it by just saying, hey, let's put in better quality cable, Cat6 cable, so that's where the Cat6 spec came from, um, that'll run to 200 megahertz, the signal is 200 megahertz, and the Cat6 spec um, for the cabling is 250 because we overswept it so to make sure it works a little beyond that 200 megahertz. So you had in the market, you could do, if you wanted to go to one gig, you could buy network cards and switches that were more expensive, but ran over your existing Cat5e at 100 megahertz using four pairs bidirectionally and all this expensive digital signal processing. Or you could go a cheaper route and buy um, a 200 megahertz card, which, you know, in new cabling. So if you were building a new building, that might make sense. Okay, put in Cat6, all of your switches and NICs will be cheaper. But if you're upgrading and retrofitting, um, it was a lot 
an easier pill to swallow to pay more for that equipment, but not tear out all your cable. Um, so those were the two systems. And basically the laws of economics took over as more people said, I'm, you know, you had, you had more people wanting to retrofit and upgrade to gig and they were buying the more expensive network cards. And of course, as more and more people bought them, the supplies of price came down. <laughs> cost goes down. Yep. And all of a sudden it became affordable. So the, and I, and I can't remember, um, I think 1000 base T is the cat six version and 1000 base TX is the 5e. I might have that reverse. Someone can, you can go online and see that. Um, but you'll see the different signaling rates. So ultimately what happened is, yeah, the cost went down and that's what we know today is the 100 megahertz four pair full duplex signaling on cat 5e cable. So, so cat six cable as a, as a media to transport gigabit really has no use. You know, it gives you more margin, more headroom, but fundamentally, if it's 100 meters that you want to run and you want to do gigabit, 5e works just as good as Cat6. Got it. That so is a might, good definitive answer. Headroom and people to this day still, you know, want to uh, put in Cat6. So if if you're going to make a jump, the jump should be considering 5e and then jumping to 6a. Right. Because 6a will get you 10 gig. Yeah, and the um, six is slowly it's come down in price but you know it's still not quite as cheap as that uh as the cat 5e um so it's still a little bit of cost savings but like i've told a lot of people and a lot of the bigger jobs we've done lately have been cat 6a if you're going to do it now yeah. uh the price is coming down on cat 6a even uh, a little bit so just go there because you, you that way you're future proof to tank um, it and you it, what just right on my head is you mentioned ptz cameras so yeah everything i'm talking about was sort of the perspective of data transmission but when you bring poe into it now you have another factor to consider um so the reason cat 6 is more expensive there's a couple reasons but one is the conductors are generally a little larger so instead of 24 gauge it might be 23 gauge 22 and a half so that slightly larger conductor will let you transmit more dc power further so with you less loss higher higher power devices. Yep. So that would be a good reason. Um, you know, if, if you don't need the data rate, but you want to put, um, you know, high power devices at the end. So cat six from that application does make sense. But I was speaking just purely from, if you want a one gig signal. Yeah. Data transport. Yeah. No, and yeah, it still makes sense. It. It's still very valid what you said. And it's, it is that uh, thing that's been debated. And in the overall picture too, the other takeaway might be uh, skip the whole CAT uh, 7 thing. So it's CAT 6A. And at some point in the far, far distant future, we're going to see CAT 8. <laughs> we have, yeah. And we have CAT 8. And like I said, the uh, limitation is that it's 30 meters um, and, and not 100. And that, now you get into um, the, the effect of frequencies. So cat eight is two gigahertz, so 2000 megahertz. And so that's very high frequency um, compared. So, so for everyone listening, you know, cat five E is hundred megahertz, cat six, 250, cat six A is 500 megahertz and cat eight is 2000 megahertz. So a big step up four times. Yeah. And what happens is you go up in frequency, the signal loss gets worse. So it's, it's actually, proportional so if it's like more or less double the frequency the signal loss is going to be twice as high and that's the main reason it, it is only good to 30 meters because at that frequency range there's just too much signal loss so you'd have to put in the, the conductors of the cable would be super thick to try to go um you know that much further so it's just not practical so it's it's data centers and, and when we were developing the standard the CADIC center we started that in 2000 maybe four or five, I think. And um, what the TIA did was go out to a lot of data center owners and look at the layout, the topology of data centers and try to figure out what length of cabling is going to meet the needs of 80% of data center owners. Because it was never assumed that you were going to see CAD8 going to the desktop. Because first of all, right. we, knew it, we knew it couldn't go 100 meters. Um, so how much did it, how long did it need to be to, to be, um, a viable solution for data center operators. And it turned out that 30 meters, um, you know, meets 80% of the needs of 
of data center users. So yeah, because the other options in a data center is running like active SFP cables or copper SFP yeah. uh, to get that to get to get the data around the data center at any high speed. So this probably makes it a little bit easier. So you can actually you know cut terminate and it's uh, you have, yeah, you definitely have more more flexibility um, as, as as far as you know doing that versus yeah, you know, uh, direct attach direct attached channel would be right thing where it's one piece of cable with, with everything built into it. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, CAD8 has, it's not taken off, um, you know, primarily because of data centers, you're not seeing people put it in a building. Now it will, you can run it a hundred meters. It won't give you 40 gig. And then, and actually um, in the ISO standards, uh, this is, there's um, a cabling spec we're working on for 25 gig and trying to get 25 gig out to um, to 100 meters. So it's a little more than 10 gig, not quite 40, <laughs> you know, somewhere in 25. Um, and then there's, I don't, have you heard of Enbase T? And I have not. So Enbase T, um, there, there's a couple of dueling technologies um, but that it's also called multi gig and and Cisco started working on that and that's now been standardized. So that is 2.5 and 5 gig. And so so now what they they're doing is you have a 10 gig switch. Um, so like right now, if you were to buy a typical 10 gig switch, if the cabling couldn't support 10 gig, the switch would fall back to one gig. Right. Um, so what a, a, a N base T or multi gig switch will do is depending on, and this is meant for if you have cat 5e or cat 6 cabling. So if, if it doesn't support 10 gig, the switch will try to fall back to five gig. And the spec says cat 6 will, you know, by design cat 6 should support five gig and a good quality cat 5e will support five gig. And if it doesn't work there, it'll fall back to 2.5 gig. Um, so it's yeah. another upgrade path. So if you have existing cabling and you want to get more bandwidth through, you can put in one of these switches. And I, you know what, I didn't realize that was the name of the standard, but I'm familiar with it because I, I have a 10 gig Asus card in mine and I know it says it supports the two and a half and five as well. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a, it's a fallback thing. So if you've got cabling that's somewhere performance wise between six and six a uh, or five E and six a you, it, you'll, get speeds um, of either one, two and a half, five or 10 gig. Okay. That, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, so that does, you know, we look at things like that. It does give you reasoning, a reason to put in the best cable you can afford because who's to say 10 years from now, some new thing doesn't come along and get even higher data rate over some cable and you put in a while back. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, um, and it's really only our edge case clients that we're installing uh, 10 gig cards in. You know, mm -hmm. some of our design clients, and even the reason I'm the only workstation in my office with it because of video editing. Um, yeah. I didn't I know the videos are stored on a NAS array back there, so all my editing is done, and it's obviously easier over a 10 gig connection. So it's like it's connected. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, and then so f the new the new standards. So speaking of 10 gig, the new TIA standard that I mentioned, the 568. Dot two D recommends uh, Cat six A for all your drops, you know, uh, to support ten gig. But for wireless access points, um, it recommends two Cat six A drops because then you get twenty gig of combined data rate. So for the new, um, well, they're not new anymore, but the AC second uh, wave yes. two access points that are high data rate, and then you have the AX. Um, so now you're getting access points that can support uh, you know, 10, 20 gig of bandwidth. So, um, you know, so for people out there who are trying to future proof and putting in cabling for access points, cause you know, we know there's so much stuff is moving over to Wi-Fi, and I'm still old school. If I can plug a cable into it, it makes me happier because I know yeah. it's going to work. Um, but you know, it, but all this, everything that's moving to Wi-Fi, you've got to provide that backhaul bandwidth from that access point back to your switch. And so, um, you know, as a minimum today, if you're in any sort of uh, corporate education, you know, large venues, environments, you, you 
probably want to do at least two six a drops for your access points. I, I was looking down. I have one of those. Um, we work a lot with Unify. And they sent us one of their stadium ones, which yeah. has that's what it has is that dual connectors for that. Exactly. Uh, because it's supposed to support this a massive amount of clients, and it's got the multi MIMO. It's got a whole array of antennas. But right away, the first question I had was, I, I looked at the network of Jacksonics. I'm like, well, how do you get all that backhauled? Hey, cool. I can connect at 1.7 giga, uh, 1.7 giga bandwidth, but I need to backhaul that off of there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so that's interesting. So I don't know if it has uh, a 10 gig file in it or not. I would assume so. If it has yeah, it's got a 10 gig and a one gig on it, which I think is okay. kind of weird. I wish it had two tens. Okay. So you, so you can get 12 or 11 gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, or, or I guess, or two. So if you had an old, you know, a one gig switch, but yeah, yeah. so that, there's, um, you know, the, the cable, the copper cabling is still, um, you know, pushing forward. The distance limitation is going to be a big thing. And so actually I wanted to hit on, on something else you, you mentioned in, in the small patch cord. Um, and I think you were reading about heat. You mentioned yes. when you were talking about those. That's a good topic. <laughs> yeah. And people go, you know, how, how does that, you know, what's the deal with heat in the patch cords? So now, the um, ge so generally speaking, the heat conversation is for high power PoE. So again, you know that's 90 watts. And the question was, okay, you get a lot of cables in a bundle. Um, what's going to happen when you know you will lose some amount of heat in that case, some amount of, some amount of energy in that cabling that um, you know is dissipated as heat? And you've got big bundles of cables together. So what happens? Um, so the so there, again this goes back to the companies that make the cable and stuff so they did tons of experiments bundling um, cables together putting thermocouples in them putting power through and measuring a heat rise um, based on how much power and how many cables in a bundle and so in that standard we there's a model in there um, so you can plug in in this mathematical model any number of cables with a certain you specify the, the wire gauge and the diameter and da, 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 and it says, okay, it predicts how much temperature rise is going to be there. Um, and the reason that's important is because the signal loss of your data, so the, the we call it insertion loss, I'm um, used to be attenuation, but the, the signal loss or insertion loss of your data is a function of three things, the length of the wire, the frequency, and the temperature of the conductor. So what could happen is if you have big bundles of cable and you're running a lot of high power PoE devices in those, the cables in the middle of that bundle will start to get hotter and hotter. It's not, they're not gonna burst into flames or anything. No. But the, the temperature could actually get high enough. Now keep in mind, you might be thinking about, oh, well I'm in an air conditioned room right now and it's like, okay, no big deal. But you know, imagine you're down in like Phoenix in the middle yeah. of the summer in an unair conditioned cable tray um, where the, the temperature up there is, you know, 130 degrees. And now you start adding temperature rise on top of that. Well, and most of them are above a drop ceiling and yeah. combined with that in conduit. So there's simply the, the there's no um, active cooling going on. It's just the ambient yes. of the heat bleeding through, which of course means it holds a lot of it in. <laughs> it does, yeah. And there's different models for in conduit and not. Um, but the, 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 the worry is that, you know, you could have a cable let, and let's say from a testing standpoint, so let's say you, you installed a bunch of this cable and you certify it and all passes cat six a, um, there's also new measurements for measuring the resistance of each conductor in the pair. So you have two conductors in a pair. So we're measuring each conductor within the pair and then within each other, because the, if the balance of the resistance, the DC resistance of the cable is off, that creates more waste of heat energy. Um, but the, the problem then is that in theory, you could have these bundles of cable getting warm where you tested it and it passed, but now all of a sudden you're actually having data issues. Cus you know, customers are complaining about slow network connections or whatever. And the, the cable can actually, the temperature can increase enough where the signal loss, the data signal loss increases to the point where you start dropping packets and stuff. So that's actually the concern with temperature is that the cable gets 
hot to a point where you actually start experiencing data losses because heat is one of those three factors in signal loss. It's length of the wire, um, frequency, and then temperature. I guess that, eight wire too. Yeah, that's really interesting because um, it's one of those, when we built the building and we tested it, it worked, and then something changed in a building that created an ambient temperature problem, um, yeah. and now we have a problem that we didn't see six months or a year ago, and yeah. it becomes the headache of troubleshooting. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's really so interesting. That model, instead of making people do all the calculations, the, the general, uh, is it uh, 40? Oh, crud, I should remember the number. It's been so long. But in that, there's a chart in there that says, you know, generally do not exceed cable bundles more than X number of cables. Because under worst case scenarios, you'll be okay. But if you start bundling cables and higher count bundles, then you could actually start to have this issue, you know, and planning ahead. You're like, well, I'm not doing POE now, but who's, when we design a cabling system, so this is interesting. People always say, why, why are the, these specs so high? So cabling, um, structure cabling systems are designed to last 20 years. So not that it will support the absolute latest and greatest technology that comes out in 20 years, but that's the desire. So, cause that's a generally how long, either a building is there, you know, yeah. or the tenant comes in and tears it out. But Before that, it gets some type of remodel retrofit that we yeah, can replace the yeah. wiring. So in. generally we're shooting for a 20 year lifespan. So, um, you know, if you're installing the latest stuff and we know that mm -hmm. most, most people out there aren't putting in, you know, all high spec cat six a or cat eight cabling or whatever, but that's, that's where the standards go. And then it, you know, it, everything trickles back down. So, you'll start, you start to see what was when cat six, a cable first came out. I mean, you were talking like $800 for a thousand foot school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was insanely expensive. And it's just, you know, prices and it just comes down to uh, mass installs. It's driving the price down. So, uh, and but, we just but, did, we did a job, I think it was 400 drops of cat six, a, um, you know, so pretty good size. And, you know, we, it's nice because the customer was forward thinking enough to going, this is what we want top to bottom. They had us because it's a 100,000 square foot building and they're like, we want all these drops, all these locations here. Uh, so if we ever want to do something more than the basics, it's there because it's there. once it's, once they put the, everything in the building, you can't get around it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is extremely expensive and inconvenient. So yeah, um, it's, it's good to have all those out there. And like you said, it's, you try to be forward thinking. So if you installed the latest uh, cat six day, you should be able to get 20 years. Well, this is a watch out for that seat, that copper clad aluminum. Oh uh, yeah. Watch we, out for that. I'm telling you, it, we have um, no shortage of customers who are having strange issues uh, with POE. And the, the fact is they're just not aware of it. So, you know, a lot I've seen, Cabling data sheets are on the box. It'll say copper cloud aluminum spelled out, but a lot of times just in small print, it'll say CCA. Yeah. Um, and I think people just don't know because there's too yeah. many price shoppers is the way exactly. I would do it. Um, and I brought this up when we were bidding uh, against a company, someone, their price was just substantially lower than ours. And I'm just like, I do, they're doing something different. And then I noticed that they had CCA because they showed me the bid sheet. Um, and I'm like, Oh, I said, that's a different type of cable. I said, I, I, I said, well, they wanted me to match with the cable. And I'm like, I, I could probably match price if I use that cable, but I'm not going to, cause I actually want to guarantee my work. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and it will, um, like it'll probably pass data, but POE later on. And then you, you get into all kinds of weird stuff with, with, um, you know, going back to like electrical wiring and housing, it used to be, they would mix copper and aluminum wiring together but you get um, corrosion, electrolysis. When well, yeah, I was gonna say, when you get to the metallurgy side of it, the, the chemistry of it, um, yeah. you don't mix metals. That's just yeah. a general rule of thumb when you're doing this. Uh, oddly, I went to school for a machine tool and welding because it wasn't in computer classes really available. But I mean, there's a lot of discussion we had on the metallurgy. And so it just stick, that's another thing is like in the back of my head going, you know, I'm not a chemist uh, or a metallurgist, but it seems like you shouldn't put these two metals together and hope that they last the next 20 years. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you punch that uh, connector down the ID or that cable down, you know, you're piercing through that wire and now you're kind of exposing the aluminum part to air and you could start to get more oxidation and, and, you know, yeah, exactly. You put it exactly right. Who's, who's to say that that it's going to work today, but a few years from now, all of a sudden things just start you know, uh, 
you start getting weird random errors as connections start to go bad and stuff. So Yeah, so just avoid all of that. Well, this was very in-depth and informative. This was a fascinating discussion. I'm really glad you reached out. Thank you, uh, thank you for taking the time. This is, uh, I think a lot of people are going to find this interesting because there's so much more that I think people even realize that go into these standards. And when you talk about the length of time, like you said, what was it in the, like, t uh, what, 13 years ago, the Cat A is when you start, or Cat A? Yeah, we, I think we started in 2004 and it was published at the end of 08. So it, it took just, about 14 years to develop yeah. that standard. Yeah. So there's just a long time and goes in there, but there's right. a lot of thought. There's a lot of engineering. Yeah. 2004 to 2018. Yeah, 2018. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't think there's anything that would ever be fast. If you put a, enough really smart engineers and have them uh, work on the nuances of coming up with a standard, it's going to take that long. <laughs> it does. Yeah, and people get frustrated, but, you know, we, it's – it's got to work. So. It's got to work. There's a lot that has to go into it. So because we, we don't want things corroding and rusting and, and failing. So, <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, that. Uh, we will be testing out that meter. Um, like I said, I, I know it, it came in just before we started this interview. So I know my staff is, uh, they were ooing and eyeing and playing with it. They probably have it plugged in right now. <laughs> so, All right. Well, go, go find some bad patch cords. <laughs> they, we're going to go test those patch cords and see what kind of load, see if there's any problem with them. And you gave me a whole multitude of other ideas, uh, like what would happen because I'm willing to destroy a couple things. Uh, if I yeah. bought a bundle of cable, heated it up, what, at what point does the change overheat? So yeah, gonna, uh, we can, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you about that. And, well, we'll, uh, we'll do the experiment <laughs> first, and then you can tell me what I did wrong. But we'll okay. be, we'll, we like, we're going to have some fun with it and do some uh, backyard science here at the office because cool. I'm curious now. <laughs> All right. So, hey, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below, which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.